Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. The Supreme Court is hearing a major challenge over abortion pill access. Find out more about what's at stake. Rescue workers are racing against the clock to find people in water after a major bridge in Baltimore collapsed. Find out more about the rescue operations and the preliminary investigation into the incident. A law that would allow non-citizens to vote is back in the courtroom after being found unconstitutional a month ago. Hear what New York City lawmakers are asking for. Chinese regime sabotage of U.S.-based Shen Yun Performing Arts appears to hit a new low with multiple bomb threats against theaters this month. We look at the latest escalation of an ongoing disruption campaign. Julian Assange will not be extradited to the United States, at least for now. The demands a London court is now making on the U.S. A German baker is keeping a centuries-old baking method alive while serving delicious Easter pastries. She uses hand-carved molds dating back hundreds of years. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, a bridge collapsed in Baltimore, Baltimore Maryland overnight. Governor Wes Moore has declared a state of emergency. Rescue operations are underway for people who were on the bridge and fell into the water. Emergency responders say at least seven people were missing and two were rescued from the water. Sonar has also detected cars in the water. To help with the rescue efforts, the FAA established a no-fly zone around the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Drones are also not allowed to operate. Daylight footage shows the extent of the damage after a cargo ship rammed into the bridge and caused it to collapse around 1.30 a.m. The White House says President Biden has been briefed on the incident and is willing to de deploy federal resources. Local authorities provide an update on the situation. We're talking about a deep channel port. It's 40, 50 feet of water, strong currents. The weather is uh, windy, the water is cold. And so we certainly worry about um, those who uh, are in the water, not to mention the fall from the bridge. If for folks who we know, we know that there were individuals working on the bridge. We are still investigating what happened, but we are quickly gathering details. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. Our administration is working closely with leaders from all levels of government and society to respond to this crisis and that rescue underway after a Baltimore bridge has collapsed. As you just saw, the cargo ship that rammed into the bridge is Singaporean. The ship's company says all 22 crew members on board are accounted for and there are no injuries. The company will fully cooperate with U.S. officials, it says. Singapore's Port Authority says it's in contact with the U.S. Coast Guard and the ship's company and will also cooperate in the investigation. And here to discuss is Jim Nels, supply chain consultant and naval veteran. Jim, welcome. Great to see you. The lights went out moments before hitting the bridge. To begin with, what might have caused this, do you think? It, it shows to me that they probably lost power. So something probably happened to the propulsion system, which then caused all the power on the ship to go out. And that's also why you see a bunch of smoke coming out of this ship right before it impacts the bridge because they're trying to restart the engine. So um, it looks to me like they lost power. They lost power probably a good thousand yards before they hit the bridge because you can see them floating into the bridge stanchion. So um, there was really nothing they could do. The one thing I don't understand is why they did not immediately drop anchor once they lost power. That is the number one thing you're supposed to do in a port when you're in a vessel that loses power is you drop your anchor so that you don't hit anything and that's what they did not do. And what kinds of precautions are usually in place to prevent something like this happening? Because it wouldn't be the first time that it's happened. Well, you would have two things. One is you're supposed to have people manning in the engine room to take care of any emergency there. And again, like I just said, you're supposed to drop anchor immediately 
if anything like that happens, when you lose power, if you lose steerage, the first thing you're supposed to do is drop your anchor so that you don't crash into anything. How frequently do um, you know issues like this happen in the U.S.? It's not very often. This this is a very rare incident, um, but when it does happen, people take the necessary precautions. So we don't see the devastation that we have seen uh, today. What frightens me a little bit is this shows the vulnerability of our ports. So that if you're looking to be a, a terrorist to attack something, imagine doing this at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in New York or the George Washington Bridge in New York or one of the river or bridges in um, the East River in New York, that would totally destroy the economy. As it stands in, in Baltimore, that port does about $80 billion a year of service. It brings in more cars and light trucks than any other port in the United States. And that bridge services about 31,000 vehicles a day. So a lot of people are gonna be disrupted. The other thing that happened with that bridge is that was the only route for hazmat hazardous materials to go across uh, the, the river there. Um, they're not allowed to go through the tunnel. So going th across that bridge was the only way. Now they're probably going to have to go through Pennsylvania, which is insane. Okay, a significant disruption there. Uh, you know, we do know, as you, as you mentioned, it doesn't look like it's a terrorist attack, but this is an open investigation, according to the FBI. Um, what kinds of monitoring or intelligence or other preventative structures do we have in place uh, in regards to protecting against you know terrorist attacks that might look like this so the coast guard knows every ship that's supposed to come into a united states port um, but they can't go and escort every ship that comes in so there's a process where if you're a ship you come in you get a pilot to come on board who knows the, the local waters uh, usually you have a couple of tugboats to, to help you as well but there's really at this point, unless we make major changes to how we think about national security, there's really nothing we can do to prevent something like this from happening. So that's, again, why I'm concerned is that if you wanted to, you can get a very inexpensive ship and ram it into a bridge and you saw the catastrophic uh, results of that. So Jim, with your experience and your understanding of this topic, what can, for example, lawmakers or what can the U.S. do to prevent something like this happening? It sounds pretty dire, you know, in terms of the threats, but what can be it, done? It is, it is dire, but let, let's again, take a step back. It's, it doesn't happen every single day. The Coast Guard needs to maintain a presence on the, at the entrance to all of our ports, but unless the Coast Guard is gonna board every single vessel that comes into American waters, there's really nothing you could do at this point to do it. It's just like if a, uh, a pilot of a foreign flagged airline decided to crash his plane into a building, there's really nothing you can do about it, unfortunately. You just have to do a better job of screening the folks before they get the chance to do that. All right. Thank you so much. Jim Nell's supply chain consultant and naval veteran. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. And you. Attorney General Merrick Garland is threatened with contempt of Congress. That's by House Judiciary Committee Chair Jim Jordan and Oversight Committee Chair James Comer. The lawmakers say the Department of Justice is withholding material from special counsel Robert Herr in his investigation. Jordan and Comer initially requested specific documents from the probe into whether President Biden mishandled classified records throughout his political career. Republicans want unredacted transcripts and audio recordings of Herr's interviews with Biden and the president's ghostwriter, Mark Zwanitzer. Herr's special counsel report states Biden relayed portions of classified diary entries nearly verbatim to his ghostwriter as they drafted his 2017 memoir entitled Promise Me Dad. House Republicans also want to determine if the Biden White House communicated with the DOJ to limit hers investigation. Former President Trump received a lifeline from an appeals court yesterday. His bond was reduced to $175 million in the $464 million case. He has 10 days to pay it. To learn more, I spoke with Mark Ruskin, former assistant district attorney in Brooklyn and retired FBI agent. Mark, great to see you. Now, what does this appeals court ruling say about Judge Angeron's ruling and the initial bond amount set? Hello, David, good to see you again. Thanks for having me here. The initial ruling was really disproportionate to such an extent as to really shock the conscience, I think, of 
others in the judiciary as well as in the legal community, both in New York and elsewhere. And I think that the appellate division ruled correctly, uh, essentially implying that the uh, the decision was absurd and, 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 and it was a disproportionate reaction, uh, regardless of uh, what the underlying issues are that presented themselves. Does this indicate a rebuke by the appeals court? Essentially, uh, it, it does uh, indirectly constitute a rebuke. For any judge on the trial level to be reversed on appeal is a, a kind of a, uh, embarrassing event, at the, to say the least. And in this case, it happened, you know, with such uh, rapidity and with such, you know, strength that it's clearly uh, both an embarrassment and a rebuke to the uh, trial judge, whom I should say was really uh, inexperienced and acted inappropriately throughout the proceedings. Who would be responsible for the tenants and staff of Trump's properties if his assets were seized? Well, it depends on the case, but essentially, normally, the uh, state uh, uh, would appoint someone like a special master or someone of that nature to be a, so you know a quote unquote independent and objective administrator for the uh, for the uh, assets. However, in a situation like this, there would be irreversible harm. You know, if there is going to be irreversible harm by the seizure, uh, should the uh, appellant prevail, then that's a good argument for why time should be taken before any seizure occurs so as to prevent uh, any kind of harm, which would be uh, 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 significant and, and tremendously damaging. You know, I should add that forfeiture, both in civil and criminal cases, is often misused uh, and is often abused uh, by the prosecutors, and I think that's an unfortunate situation, uh, in order to uh, uh, essentially punish further uh, individuals who already have a, a lot on their hands without having to deal with forfeiture issues. All right, Mark, thank you for informing us and our viewers and giving your insight on this. My pleasure. Good to see you again. A DOJ official says election workers are being scapegoated, targeted, and attacked. 20 people have been charged so far, according to federal officials. This behavior is insidious, with potentially grave consequences for individual victims and for the institution of election administration as a whole. These threats must stop. The public must know. Any criminal threats to the election community will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona said they would continue to investigate and prosecute those who do harm to, quote, the first responders of democracy. A DOJ officials said 13 of the 20 charged have already been convicted. Two of the convicted were sentenced for making threats against Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs. Arizona was at the center of stolen election claims in 2020. Former President Trump was declared to lose the state by a narrow margin. And non-citizens may be closer to being allowed to vote in New York City. The local council is appealing to the state's top court to support a law they passed in 2022. The law lets people who aren't citizens but have green cards or work permits to vote in city elections. A spokesperson for the council said it would strengthen New York City by increasing civic engagement. A lower court ruled last month that the law violates the state's constitution. It would allow around 800,000 non-citizens to vote in city elections, like the mayor or city council elections. A coalition of conservatives challenged the law, saying it would diminish the votes of tax-paying U.S. citizens. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is expected to announce his running mate today at a rally in Oakland, California. The New York Times is reporting he will pick attorney and entrepreneur Nicole Shanahan, who has ties to the area, she was born in Oakland and was previously married to Google co-founder Sergey Brin. Shanahan also has been one of the largest donors to Kennedy's independent campaign. 
This is a critical moment for Kennedy's White House bid as he looks to accelerate his efforts to gain ballot access in all 50 states. Coming up, children under 14 no longer allowed on social media in Florida. More on the law just signed by DeSantis and what it means for the youth. Raw emotion unleashed as fed up property owners in a New York community share harrowing tales of squatters taking over their homes. Looking for a healthy and smooth tasting brew? Drop by Day's Coffee Roasters today and explore our wide selection of specialty grade small batch roasted coffee. Home to North America's first enzyme fermented coffee, we source a wide selection of specialty grade coffee beans from around the world and our baristas are ready to craft your customized brew. Visit Day's Coffee at 28 North Street, Middletown, New York. Come experience a brew like no other. I had a pretty normal mom life. Everything was pretty good and it was a very happy life. And we just had a new baby. And then all of a sudden within a day or two, she's on life support and fighting for her life. Then I knew something was pretty wrong. A little less than a week after I came home, I couldn't breathe. That's when we decided to go to the hospital. I was given the diagnosis that I had peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is basically a pregnancy-induced heart failure. They told me my only chance was a heart transplant. And the American Heart Association helped make that possible. Their research helped save me. This could not happen without monthly donations from friends like you. Your sustained support helps fund life-saving research that leads to medical breakthroughs, like those that gave Jen a second chance at life. Heart disease is the number one killer in America, and we urgently need your help to save lives. Go to helpheart.org or call now to become a monthly donor today. Your donation of only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, will make a difference through prevention, early detection, treatments, and cures that help save lives. I am very thankful for the American Heart Association. I am grateful for just every day that I get with my children. Please go to helpheart.org or call now with your donation of just $19 a month. Join our community of monthly donors, and you'll get this limited edition t-shirt you could wear to show you're helping save lives. One simple act today can save your life or the life of a loved one. So please, call or go to helpheart.org now to help save lives. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. The Supreme Court is hearing oral arguments now in a major case involving abortion pills. The Biden administration wants to preserve broad access to the abortion pill mifepristone. The FDA gave its opening statement. Millions of Americans have used mifepristone to safely end their pregnancies. Respondents may not agree with that choice, but that doesn't give them Article III standing or a legal basis to upend the regulatory scheme. At the outset, respondents lack standing. They now concede they can't rely on a statistical theory of injury like the lower courts did. Instead, they have to identify a specific doctor who faces imminent harm. The Biden administration is appealing a lower court's ruling that would limit how mifepristone is prescribed and distributed. Four medical associations and four doctors who oppose abortion brought the challenge to mifepristone in Texas. 
After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, medication-based abortion has become the most common method of ending pregnancies in the United States. They now account for more than 60% of abortions. Hundreds of protesters from both sides of the abortion debate are gathering outside the Supreme Court as justices hear the case. And hip-hop star Sean Combs, also known by his stage name Diddy, is under investigation by the Department of Homeland Security. Yesterday, agents searched the rapper's properties in Los Angeles and Miami. Here's more. Los Angeles-based television stations showed aerial footage of Homeland Security investigations agents and other law enforcement authorities entering an L.A. mansion on Monday. The exact nature of the investigation has not yet been made public. Footage from the raid at Combs' L.A. home shows at least three people being apprehended by agents. The investigation is directed by Homeland Security agents in New York, where Combs was accused in federal court by an ex-girlfriend of engaging in sex trafficking. In November, Cassandra Ventura accused the rapper and hip-hop executive of serial physical abuse, sexual slavery, and rape. The lawsuit cited violations of sex trafficking and human trafficking statutes under federal, New York, and California laws. A lawyer for Combs denied the allegations. One day after the accusations were made, Combs and Ventura jointly announced they had settled the case out of court. The lawyer maintained that the settlement was in no way an admission of his client's wrongdoing. Ventura's lawsuit was one of at least four civil complaints in recent months, leveling sexual assault allegations against Combs. In December, a civil complaint accused Combs of taking part in a gang rape of a teenager that he allegedly arranged to fly from Detroit to New York 20 years ago. Combs in a statement denied the allegations as fabrications by people seeking money. Combs is the founder of Bad Boy Records and is one of the most influential producers in hip-hop. He has gone by various stage names, including Puff Daddy and P. Diddy. Bad Boy Records has been credited with the discovery of artists like Notorious B.I.G. and Usher. Combs' whereabouts are not confirmed at the moment. His private jet was earlier seen landing in the Caribbean, but a recent video apparently shows him at Miami Airport. And New York City plans to send at least 800 police officers into the subway system to deter turnstile jumpers. A string of recent moves aims to address concerns about public safety and disorder. Police have arrested over 1,700 people for turnstile jumping so far this year, compared to 965 this time last year. Officers have issued fair evasion tickets to over 28,000 people so far this year. Hours before Monday's announcement, a man was stabbed multiple times on a subway train in a dispute over smoking. Hours after the announcement, a person was shoved onto the tracks in East Harlem and killed by an approaching train. Police took a 45-year-old man into custody. And in related news, New York City police officer Jonathan Diller was shot and killed Monday during a traffic stop. The murder marks the first slaying of an NYPD officer in two years. The shooting happened just before 5.50 p.m. in the Far Rockaway neighborhood of Queens. Diller was 31 years old and leaves behind a wife and a one-year-old son. And we, we really send out our condolences to him and his, to his family. But uh, turning now to business news, we have NTD business host Don Ma to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. Welcome, Don. Yeah, great to be here, Steph. Yeah. Don, so um, what do you have for us today? Uh, just two th quick things here today, and one of them is a new social media law that is going to restrict some young users as well as Tesla offering something, a, a free trial for some of its uh, cool features for a month. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. But starting with uh, this new law, DeSantis yesterday signed a bill that bans children aged under 14. So banning them from social media platforms and requiring 14 and 15 year olds to get parental consent. So this measure actually requires social media flat platforms to in fact terminate the accounts of people under 14 who have already signed up before this bill and those uh, people under 16 who do not have parental consent. It requires them to use a third party verification system to screen out anyone who is actually underage and is under, uh, on the platform. DeSantis said in a statement that uh, social media harms children in a variety of ways. And he says uh, that, quote, uh, this legislation gives parents greater ability to protect uh, their kids. Uh, so the bill actually does not uh, name any specific social media platforms, but states that it targets uh, social media sites that promote, for example, infinite scrolling or uh, reaction metrics like 
uh, uh, such as likes and uh, feature autoplay videos and have live stream and push notifications. Uh, but it would exempt websites and apps whose main function is, for example, email or messaging or texting between uh, sender and recipient. Wow, this looks like it could be a really big deal. I mean, from what psychologists have said about the effects of social media on children, plus this, you know, issues over parental rights and how strong that is getting, especially in Florida. So we'll have to see whether there's pushback there, of course. But you mentioned also there's news about Tesla and they have a new offer. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so electric car maker Tesla is, is going to offer U.S. customers a month's free trial of its uh, driver assist technology. So this is called full self-driving, and this is according to its CEO, Elon Musk. So Musk has long touted the driver assistant software, uh, which by the way, is priced at $12,000 uh, as a potential profit generator for the company. But the car actually has fallen short of full autonomy for years now uh, amid uh, legal scrutiny and regulatory scrutiny of Tesla's safety and marketing. Uh, so Musk said in a post on uh, social media platform X that all US car users uh, that are capable of FSD, so that's the self-driving feature, uh, will be enabled for one month uh, for free, and it's going to be a trial. Uh, he has also told Tesla staff to give demonstrations of FSD to new buyers and owners of self, uh, sorry, owners and new buyers of serviced vehicles. Uh, and this is according to two emails verified by a source. And Musk said that in one of the emails sent to Tesla employees that almost no one actually realizes how well uh, FSD actually works. So it's going to be interesting to see if this new trial is going to uh, get more people to purchase this $12,000 feature. Mm. Right, yeah, I mean, Tesla, um, Elon Musk and Tesla at the forefront of EV and you know self-driving. So I know a lot of people that like Tesla's electric vehicles, but they're not too sure about you know letting the car drive itself. So we'll see how this one month program you know, work out for people. Yeah, hopefully there won't be any crashes with that trial. Yeah. yeah. All right, Don, thank you so much. Thank you. Property rights are in the spotlight due to highly publicized clashes between squatters and homeowners. A New York City councilwoman held a conference yesterday on the subject. NTD's Daniel Monahan has the highlights from those in attendance. Councilwoman Vicky Palladino addressed residents in Bayside, Queens, telling them the situation with squatting has gotten out of control. You have every right to defend your property. You will do it as you need to do it. Palladino brought up the recent case of a woman who inherited an apartment in Manhattan and returned to it from Spain. To find two illegal immigrants in that apartment who beat her to a pulp where her 19-year-old son found her stuffed in a duffel bag. Palladino says society has reached a point where very serious decisions have to be made. According to the councilwoman, the majority of squatters prey on the weakness of New York laws. That puts the tenants backslash squatters ahead of you, the property owners. Palladino told supporters that property rights are one of the most fundamental rights that Americans have. People were gathered outside the house of a homeowner named Susan, who says her house was taken over by squatters who scammed her mom, who has since passed away. I didn't want to sell my mother's house. I haven't even been able to go through her stuff. It's just not fair that I'm forced to sell the house. But to make matters even worse, I sold the house and they still won't leave. This homeowner says his eviction case took two years and that the tenants only paid one month's rent the whole time. They eventually escaped when warrants for their arrest from another state became known. His lawyer told him not to change the locks, as that would be considered an illegal eviction by the courts. A few days later, a new group of people moved into my property without my permission. This constituent says homeowners are treated like criminals. People buy a property thinking this is the American dream and that this is having the retirement fund. And then something like they go away on vacation, someone takes over their home, and the laws are not protecting us. The concerned citizen is calling out lawmakers. The laws have really 
done a lot of damage to our society. It makes us really question, like, what are elected officials working for? Some in attendance called on people to contact their governmental representatives and demand action on fair laws for homeowners. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. China could be planning a superhighway that targets the United States. This could exacerbate mass migration and potential economic warfare. The new project has worried some who fear completing the road into Panama will be a win for China and a loss for America. I spoke with Darlene Sanchez, an Epic Times reporter who visited the Darien Gap. Darlene, thank you for joining us. Now, why does this Pan-American superhighway matter? Well, the main thing about this is it's in the, you know, we went down to the Panama Canal Zone. We went down to the Darien Gap in Panama. Uh, the Epic Times did. I was the reporter there. And while there, we noticed that there was a bridge being built into the jungle, into the Darien Gap, which dead ended into nowhere, basically. And so um, I started looking into that. And it came out that, you know, there were, in fact, some uh, indications that China might be wanting to build a road through the Darien Gap, uh, connecting uh, South America to North America. In March, Army General Laura Richardson warned that the CCP aims to replace the U.S. as the world's leading economic and military power. So what does the Chinese regime want with this power? Well, what's happening is if you look at, you know, while we were down there looking at mass migration, if this superhighway, so to speak, is ever connected, which, you know, there are people there that say that all signs point toward that and that China would benefit from it, the United States would not benefit from it. In fact, it would be detrimental to the United States because it would open up the floodgates for illegal migration from um, South America. And it would also, if China was in control of this Darien Gap, say it's a railway or even a highway connected there, then that's a choke point. Choke points are strategic militarily and economically, because if you control those, you can control commerce and you can control troop movement. And I think that's what our military leaders are very concerned about right now. So what is the current status of this new development, this project that's currently being constructed? Right now, um, on the Panamanian side, the gap basically straddles uh, Panama and Colombia. Um, you know, it's a jungle. It's very treacherous and dangerous. A lot of uh, migrants have been moving through this area. Um, but what's happening on the Panamanian side is they are building $42 million worth of bridges and roads deeper into the jungle, which will leave about 55 miles left to connect the two highway points. The other side of the highway is in Colombia, and the Chinese have some construction going on there and in highway development near the end of the uh, Panamanian, Panamanian highway there in Colombia as well. So you can see, you know, the, the pieces are lining up here, and there is concern about that. So Darlene, uh, where else in the world is the Chinese regime trying to develop militarily or economically? Yes, well, I mean, you know, this is stretching all over the world. They've, uh, you know, around 2018 is when they started really pushing into Latin America. But, uh, you know, this is the U.S.'s backyard. They actually have built a uh, warehouse in Canada, believe it or not, right above our northern border. So you can see, you know, it's like one of the experts said, it's like a bow constrictor is tightening and tightening its grip around the United States here in the home front. Darlene, thank you so much for your insight and for um, coming on the show with us. Thank you so much. Up next, Julian Assange will not be extradited to the United States, at least for now. We'll bring you more on the demands a London court is now making on the U.S. Russia yet again extending pre-trial detention for American journalist Evan Gershkovich. We'll have the details on the latest court ruling soon when we return. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. 
explore shenyuncreations.com If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, ride your bike. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, smile big and bright. Thousands of your kids just like me are happy every day. And it's all because of generous people like you who support Shriners Hospitals for Children every month. All you have to do is call the number on your screen or go online to loveshriners.org right now with your monthly gift. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children is able to make an everyday miracle happen for kids like me. If you're happy and you know it, dance around. And when you call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Will today be the day you send your love to the rescue? When you call the number on your screen right now and give as little as $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you'll be making a life-changing difference for a child, just like Sarah. Your monthly gift today could change your life forever. Because of you. We are happy and we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please call or go online right now to give. If operators are busy, please wait patiently or go to loveshriners.org right away. Eva Marie smoked 12,000 packs of cigarettes over 15 years. She quit, and now there's a new lung cancer screening that could save her life. You stop smoking, now start screening. No matter how much you smoked, early detection could save you. Talk to your doctor or learn more at savedbythescan.org. I'm Iris Cow at the White House, and we are NTD. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, appears to be stepping up a sabotage campaign against Shen Yun Performing Arts. The New York-based classical Chinese dance company is a top target of the Chinese regime. Shen Yun shares traditional Chinese culture with audiences worldwide. It also uses artistic expression to expose the persecution taking place in China against people of faith. Since its formation, Shen Yun has encountered various forms of CCP interference, harassment, and vandalism over the years. But the communist regime appears to have added a new tactic to disrupt the performances. The Performing Arts Group says it received three bomb threats in just over a week. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has more on this story. The first bomb threat against Shen Yun Performing Arts this month targeted the company's headquarters in New York. An email account with a Chinese name said they'd placed a remote control bomb and threatened to detonate it. A Shen Yun representative told the Epic Times that the FBI is investigating the incident. Then email sent to two theaters threatened to blow up bombs, if the theaters didn't cancel upcoming Shen Yun performances. Last week, an account name with Chinese characters sent an email titled The Theater Has Been Bombed to a California venue where Shen Yun was preparing for weekend shows. The email said we randomly placed a lot of bombs in the theater. Theater staff evacuated and called the police. Bomb technicians with detection canines found nothing in their search. A police spokesperson told the Epic Times precautions were taken on the weekend, with no evidence of any type of explosive device. They stated the case and information was forwarded to the FBI for further investigation. A third bomb threat was sent to a theater in Vancouver, British Columbia over the weekend, but performances weren't interrupted. A Vancouver PD spokesperson confirmed that a theater bomb threat came in Saturday, with an investigation revealing it was false. The bomb threats turned out to be empty, but it's not the only disruptive efforts the performing arts company has faced. Two of Shen Yun's tour buses had tires slashed two weeks ago in Costa Mesa, California, the latest in a recurring series of incidents. The tires were vandalized the same way as previous times, halfway through the rubber to burst when driven on the freeway. 
Many of Shen Yun's artists experienced CCP persecution firsthand in China for practicing Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. It's a meditation practice based on truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. The spiritual practice has been banned and persecuted in China since 1999. A Shen Yun vice president said the threats are the Chinese regime's last-ditch effort to hide the truth, and that the threats are taken seriously with law enforcement authorities involved. Shen Yun performs in around 200 cities worldwide for over 1 million people each year. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Also recently, members of one of the troops were harassed at O'Hare International Airport in Chicago by a customs official speaking Mandarin with a mainland accent. The incident has spurred several Congress members to call for an investigation. Separate from these incidents, the Epic Times recently reported that the New York Times has been working on a hit piece on the company. It comes after years of the outlets downplaying or ignoring human rights abuses happening in China. Communications obtained by the Epic Times suggest the hit piece has been in the works for about six months. The Epoch Times says the article, which is not published yet, will play into the CCP's transnational repression campaign against Shen Yun. This is significant because Shen Yun exposes, through its expressive dance, the CCP's persecution of the peaceful spiritual movement Falun Gong, many of whom are killed by the Chinese regime for their organs to turn a profit. That information is not what the CCP wants people to know, as evidenced by pressuring theaters to drop performances and persecuting the family members who are in China of Shen Yun performers. Russian State News reports that an official is accusing the United States, the UK and Ukraine of being behind the Moscow Concert Hall attack. Russian President Vladimir Putin also suggested that Ukraine may have played a role in the attack. Friday's shooting killed at least 139 people and left 182 wounded. The U.S. State Department has said Ukraine was not involved. The Islamic State terror group claimed responsibility and released footage of the attack. Western countries, including the U.S. and France, have said their intelligence indicates that ISIS-K, Islamic State's Afghan offshoot, was responsible. Eight suspects are in pre-trial detention after gunmen shot con concert goers in Russia's deadliest terror attack in two decades. Russia said the four suspected gunmen confessed. They showed signs of injuries when they appeared in court. And staying in Europe, we have some short headlines from Belgium, Germany and other European countries. Julian Assange will not be extradited to the United States, at least for now. The WikiLeaks founder secured a temporary win today. London's High Court says the U.S. must guarantee Assange would not face the death penalty. If they don't do so by April 16th, he will be eligible to appeal his extradition. American prosecutors are seeking to put Assange on trial on 18 counts. That's over his high-profile re release of confidential U.S. military records and diplomatic information. A further hearing is, has been scheduled for May 20th, meaning his extradition has been put on hold. Russia is extending pre-trial detention of an American Wall Street Journal reporter. A Moscow court today ordered Evan, Evan Gershkovich to remain in jail on espionage charges until at least late June. He's currently being held at Moscow's Lefortovo prison, which is notorious for its harsh conditions. The American was arrested almost exactly one year ago while on a reporting trip in central Russia. Gershkovich and his employer have denied the espionage allegations. The U.S. government has declared him to be wrongfully detained. Belgian farmers sprayed manure towards police in the nation's capital today. The police responded by using water cannons and tear gas. Dozens of tractors sealed off streets close to European Union headquarters. They're protesting ahead of a meeting of EU agriculture ministers. The farmers are against increased environmental measures, cheap imports, and unbalanced trading practices. Due to the protests, authorities asked commuters to stay out of Brussels and work from home today. And farmers in the UK are also protesting. They drove dozens of tractors towards Britain's parliament on Monday to protest rules that they say are endangering livelihoods and food security. Similar to farmers in the EU, the ones in the UK are also protesting cheap imports that undercut prices. Some tractors had signs reading, Stop Substandard Imports. Britain has so far not seen large-scale farmers' protests like those in France and other European countries.
And lastly, Germans won't have to deal with yet another strike at the nation's rail operator over the Easter holidays. Deutsche Bahn today said it agreed to deal with to, uh, agreed to a deal with the workers' union. They'll now gradually reduce train drivers' working hours and increase their wages. This ends months of dispute and nationwide strikes. As part of the deal, both sides agreed that there won't be any more strikes for at least nearly two years. And coming up, a creative way to recycle used plastic bottles by turning them into brooms. See how Cambodian workers are doing it. A German baker is keeping a centuries-old baking method alive while serving delicious Easter pastries. She uses hand-carved molds dating back hundreds of years. More shortly, here on NTD News Today. The biggest investigation in FBI history. There are more than 1,100 arrests. I sacrificed my dream job to share this information with the American people. Those involved must be held accountable. He's an innocent man. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. They're just young people, hungry, homeless, and vulnerable. Abused youth often feel safer on the street. Now, more than ever, that's the most dangerous place of all. Covenant House is helping young adults facing homelessness. We're providing safe shelter to thousands, but the need is overwhelming, and no young person is ever turned away. Please call or go online now with your gift of $19 a month to help a young person, you'll provide safe shelter, hot meals, and medical care. Your gift will show them they're loved. Homeless young people are afraid and alone with nowhere else to turn. You want to know that there's somewhere you can go that's safe. So the Covenant House did that for us. Please call now with your gift of $19 a month. We'll send you this blanket as a reminder of the comfort your gift provides a young person tonight. Please don't wait. Your gift is the lifeline a young person needs now. Call the number on your screen or go online to safeplacetosleep.org. Thank you for saving precious lives. Meet the scam. A simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. I'm here to save you! But I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at SaveByTheScan.org. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, but let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly right here on NTD News for a full dose of America's Hope. In a small warehouse in Cambodia's capital city, a group of workers sit and spin empty plastic bottles into strips, which are then turned into the bristles of a common household item, broomsticks. Let's take a look. This small warehouse in Cambodia is transforming trash into cleaning tools. 
Workers there are spinning tons of plastic bottles into bristles for brooms. Since March 2023, they have upcycled around 40 tons of discarded plastic bottles. The plastic strips spun from the empty bottles are bundled on a machine, soaked in hot water to soften them, sliced into strips, and sewn onto bamboo sticks with metal wires. Running this small operation is 41-year-old Cambodian entrepreneur Has Kia. He has made it his mission to reduce plastic pollution in his community. So far, we have gone through about 40 tons of plastic bottles, so it's quite a large amount of recycling that has gone into the broomsticks, which are very durable and can be used for a long time. The buyers are excited, and we as the manufacturer are also happy, and it is beneficial to the society, who are supporting us too. It also helps reduce pollution in the environment and encourages people to collect plastic bottles to sell to us at a higher price, which in turn could earn them a better living. In 2010, Kia briefly worked as a conventional broomstick seller and recognized the high demand for quality brooms, which are mainly imported from Thailand and Vietnam. Kia's big idea came when he realized raw materials are cheaper at home, both the bamboo and the bottles. Plastic bottles are more expensive overseas and they were upcycling them. I learned that the bottles here are cheaper, together with the cost of other raw materials like bamboo sticks and the cost of labor. So I decided to make them by just designing the shape of a nice-looking broomstick. According to Cambodia's Environment Ministry, up to a fifth of the waste in capital Phnom Penh is plastic. Single-use plastics like bags, straws, and bottles are the main culprits clogging up landfills and waterways. There are about 35,000 to 38,000 tons of trash generated per day in Phnom Penh. This is a huge amount of garbage consumption from about 3 million people in the city, which means one person produces about 2.6 pounds of trash per day. Kia's team churns out 500 plastic broomsticks every day. With what seems like an endless supply of plastic, he says he doesn't see business drying up soon. He also says he's open to competition in the hopes of encouraging more recycling and to help take a bigger bite out of pollution. And as Easter approaches, a woman in Munich keeps a traditional cookie baking method alive. It uses a special recipe and baking forms dating back hundreds of years. The cookies are called Springerli. They get their name from the dough, which springs up while baking. Let's take a look at this generations-old treat. The dough is in the oven. After a few minutes, a miracle happens. The dough springs up. A Springerli cookie is born. Katharina Ratzinger practices the profession of gingerbread baker, one dating back to the 13th century. Katharina's collection of forms used to make the cookies date back generations in her family. And I have a great model sammlung from my forefathers geerbt. Four generations sammeln jetzt alte Holzmodel and with them we make Springerle here. The ingredients of the dough are simple enough, but the preparation before baking requires a lot of time. Also Springerle is a Gebäck aus Eier, Mehl and Zucker, that man mit den Formen prägt. Also ich drücke den Teig in die Form rein, dann nehme ich den Teig wieder raus. Dann wird er bearbeitet, kommt auf ein Blech und trocknet dort bei uns zwei Tage, was schon sehr aufwendig ist, mal so genau zwei Tage Ruhezeit. Und wenn er auf dem Blech liegt, dann ist das Gebäck nur vier Millimeter hoch. So, so rolle ich den Teig aus. Das the wooden molds she uses are hand carved. She has one dating back over 300 years. Sieht man hier schon ziemlich wurmstichig, dieser wunderschöne Reiter und eine Spinnerin. Es waren früher sehr beliebte äh, Motive, die Gutsherren schnitzen haben lassen. Da habe ich hier eins von 1697. During Easter, she uses many different models for the cookies, including rabbits, fish, Easter eggs, hearts, suns or flowers. But what's her most popular form? Also wir haben ganz viel Hasenabbildung, aber was das meiste sind, sind die Osterlämmer und die wirklich in ganz vielen unterschiedlichen Darstellungen. Katharina starts baking the Easter Springerly right after Christmas. She's now baking the last few batches before Easter arrives. According to ancient tradition, the sweet pastries will hang on Easter branches to be happily eaten by young and old. 
For round the clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. So there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD. I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. Invigorating. It was encouraging. Gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must see. Must see. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at Shenyun.com. Tangazo hili linahusunja. Tarajia kuona watoto wakiwa na njaa katika maeneo haya. Mambo yalikuwa bora kwa miaka mingi tuliweza kupigana na njaa na watoto wachache walikufa. Lakini sasa mambo yamebadilika na kwa mabaya zaidi. Hii ni kwa sababu wakati huu hukame umeangamiza zaidi. Через війни та конфлікти ми мусимо залишати наші домівки і всі наші речі. Ми навіть не маємо їжі. Тому нам потрібна ваша допомога. Millions of children are fighting to survive due to inequality, conflict, poverty, and the climate crisis. Save the Children is working alongside communities to provide a better life for children. And there's a way you can help. Please call or go online to give just $10 a month only 33 cents a day. We urgently need 1,000 new monthly donors in the next 30 days to help the children we support around the world. You can help provide food, medicine, care, and protection, plus so much more that a child needs by calling right now and giving just $10 a month. All we need are 1,000 monthly donors in the next 30 days. Please call or go online now with your monthly gift of just $10. Thanks to generous government grants, every dollar you give can have up to 10 times the impact. And when you call with your credit card, we will send you this Save the Children tote bag as a thank you for your support. Your small monthly donation of just $10 could be the reason a child in crisis survives. Please call or go online to hungerstopsnow.org to help save lives today. There's always a searching process for beauty. You know it when you see it. Want to know what's really happening around the world? Join us for a deep dive discussion with our expert panel on International Reporters Roundtable.
Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are our top stories. Secretary of State Antony Blinken meets his Iraqi counterpart. Find out mo more about their agenda and current conditions in the Middle East. Former President Trump is now one of the 500 richest people in the world. How the stock market debut of Truth Social is impacting his net worth. Rescue efforts are underway for at least six people after a main bridge in Baltimore collapsed after being struck by a cargo ship. Our reporter Luis Martinez has the latest. In the Supreme Court, should the FDA reinstate tighter restrictions on access to an abortion pill? Our legal correspondent breaks down the arguments. Chinese regime sabotage of a U.S.-based Shenyun performing arts appears to hit a new low with multiple bomb threats against theaters this month. We look at the latest escalation of an ongoing disruption campaign. Italy marks the 80th anniversary of one of the most horrific World War II massacres with a symphony honoring the dead. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, we have more updates on the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting his Iraqi counterpart at the State Department. I think it's very important that, unfortunately, we be reminded that ISIS remains uh, a real threat. Uh, and uh, despite the very good work that we've done over the years in uh, dealing with that threat uh, and uh, mitigating it significantly, we're reminded by the horrific attack uh, outside of Moscow just a few days ago that ISIS remains uh, a potentially potent force and one that we have to continue to deal with. Blinken's meeting with the Iraqi foreign minister focused on peace and stability in the Middle East, including fighting terrorism. Blinken calls Iraq an important partner, critical to the stability of the region. The Iraqi foreign minister says his country and the U.S. are partners in the fight against ISIS and will continue to work together in various fields. ISIS operates mainly in Syria and Iraq, but also in Afghanistan and Africa. Elsewhere in the Middle East, the Houthi terrorists in Yemen continue to attack commercial ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. The terrorist group announced they had mounted six attacks with drones and missiles in the last 72 hours. The group added that they also attacked two U.S. destroyers in the Red Sea, as well as Israel's city of Eilat. It was not clear immediately if any of the targets were struck. This comes as hostage and ceasefire negotiations are once again stalled. An Israeli delegation left Qatar earlier today after Hamas rejected the latest proposal on releasing hostages. And former President Trump says he would have reacted the same way Israel did after Hamas's October 7th attack. But Trump says Israel is losing international support and should finish up its war against the terror group in Gaza. The former president made the comments in an interview with an Israeli newspaper published on Monday. A video of the interview was posted on the newspaper's website. Trump says Hamas's killing spree was one of the saddest things he'd ever seen. The October 7th attack sparked the war in Gaza that has raged for nearly half a year. Israeli says, Israel says its offensive will continue until Hamas is destroyed and its hostages in Gaza are released. Trump was also asked how he would have reacted had his family been victims of Hamas's rampage. The former president said only a fool wouldn't react the way that Israel did. And families of hostages held by Hamas gathered in Tel Aviv yesterday to voice their concerns. This comes after the United Nations Security Council adopted a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants Hamas. Family members said their loved ones should be released before a ceasefire is considered in the Gaza Strip. What happened today in the UN, I don't know how it will be affect on us, but everybody should understand. It can't be a ceasefire without bringing them home. It can't be a ceasefire without bringing them home. It's not possible. First bring them home, and then we'd be a ceasefire. This is the most logic thing that uh, we can do. 
Joining us now to discuss is Rabbi Abraham Cooper, the chair of the U.S. Commission on International US Religious Freedom and associate dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Rabbi, welcome. Now, the, the White House says that Netanyahu is overreacting since his reaction to the UN Security Council's vote and the fact that the U.S. abstained from voting. What does all this mean for U.S.-Israel relations? Well, uh, there's no question it's a, a rocky patch right now, exactly when uh, Israel doesn't need it. It still has to worry about a potential war with Hezbollah in the north. Uh, and it doesn't have his hostages home. I think what angered Israelis the most across the political spectrum is that this latest resolution, which the U.S. did not veto, does not link the release of the remaining 134 hostages, probably at least 35 of them already dead. It doesn't link it to any ceasefire. Uh, it doesn't mention, it doesn't denounce Hamas by name. So the morning after explanations by the U.S. may be reassuring to some, but I think to the hostages' families and to the Israeli men in the street, it was a devastating move. So how uh, could that I, really be considered a, an agreement or a deal if there's not accountability on both sides? sides. We're talking about uh, innocent hostages, hundreds of people taken, kidnapped, raped, and uh, now in the, uh, I think, well beyond four months in captivity. What do you mean both sides? I the guess I mean, if, if, place, if it's not linked, you know, if it's not linked. The place you know, is the innocent linked. people who were taken hostage by a terrorist group, by the U.S.'s own definition. You wanted, there was a ceasefire on October 6th. You want another ceasefire? Release the hostages and you'll have a ceasefire. This resolution uh, definitely goes off the rails. There's no more linkage between the two. And I think that the damage has been done. Right now, as we speak, the political leaders of Hamas are up in Tehran meeting with their benefactors, uh, the Ayatollah. And they're basically, I think, having a kind of victory party. It may sound crazy to the rest of us, all of the Palestinians who are suffering, this war that's been going on, Israelis, but from the point of view of Hamas, and the Iranians, this is a huge victory. Yeah, if, if the release of hostages is not linked to the ceasefire, then really it's just a call for a ceasefire. It's not a, it's not a deal. It's not a call for actions on both sides. But I just wanted to ask, you know, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan yesterday said that he had related to, his, to Israel's defense minister that Biden is still steadfast in supporting Israel. How, what kind of impact would that have amidst all of these actions, especially something that speaks louder than words, which is the U.S.'s abstention from taking action during that you know, vote? vote? From Israel's point of view, the United States is her greatest benefactor, friend, and ally. So long range, you don't want to pick a fight where you quote unquote, you're right and they're wrong and damage the long term relationship. But I also think from the United States side, uh, of course, Israelis are feeling it, but how do you think the Ukrainians <clears throat> and people in Taiwan uh, feel when they take a look at what seems to be a major step away from a rock solid commitment, a rock solid relationship, especially as it deals with a basic humanitarian issue of hostages. So um, I think a Sullivan statement is important, but the actions of the United States have to convince Israel's enemies and America's enemies that there's no true change in American policy and steadfastness. And just lastly, Rabbi, what would that look like to you? To you? Well, I think, uh, you know, there are five U.S. hostages among the 136, uh, uh, 134 people is, that are still there. For starters, Joe Biden can demand an immediate release of those five hostages. He's never uh, done so. Uh, and, and I think uh, from a practical point of view, signaling friend and foe alike that the United States, as President Biden did on his own when he flew to Israel at the beginning of all of this, has Israel's back. When that message will be delivered, not only in quiet one-on-one -on -one meetings, but in the international halls of diplomacy and to the media, uh, that is something that, in my opinion, will hasten the end of the war. 
in Gaza and might yet save some of those uh, uh, despairing, uh, uh, innocent hostages still being held. And we look forward to that day. Thank you so much, Rabbi Abraham Cooper. Abraham Cooper. Thank you. And former President Trump's net worth is climbing, and he's now on the list of the 500 wealthiest people. This is after his Truth Social debuted on the stock market. Trump Media and Technology Group owns the social media platform. It began trading on NASDAQ at today's opening bell. Trump's stake in Truth Social was valued at nearly $4 billion. According to Bloomberg, the deal pushes Trump's net worth to $6.5 billion. This puts him among the wealthiest 500 people in the world on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Trump's assets are spread across a wide variety of areas, including revenues from hotels and golf courses, stake in buildings, royalties, licensing fees, and managing fees. Attorney General Mark Merrick Garland is threatened with contempt of Congress. That's by House Judiciary Committee Chair Jim Jordan and Oversight Committee Chair James Comer. The lawmakers say the Department of Justice is withholding material from special counsel Robert Herr in his investigation. Jordan and Comer initially requested specific documents from the probe into whether President Biden mishandled classified records throughout his political career. Republicans want unredacted transcripts and audio recordings of Herr's interviews with Biden and the president's ghostwriter Mark Zwanitzer. Her's special counsel report states Biden relayed portions of classified diary entries nearly verbatim to his ghostwriter as they drafted his 27 memoir entitled Promise Me Dad. House Republicans also want to determine if the Biden White House communicated with the DOJ to limit Her's investigation. A DOJ official says election workers are being scapegoated, targeted and attacked. 20 people have been charged so far, according to federal officials. This behavior is insidious, with potentially grave consequences for individual victims and for the institution of election administration as a whole. These threats must stop. The public must know. Any criminal threats to the election community will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona said they would continue to investigate and prosecute those who do harm to, quote, the first responders of democracy. A DOJ official said 13 of the 20 charged have already been convicted. Two of the convicted were sentenced for making threats against Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs. Arizona was at the center of stolen election claims in 2020. Former President Trump was declared to lose the state by a narrow margin. Non-citizens may be closer to being allowed to vote in New York City. The local council is appealing to the state's top court to support a law they passed in 2022. The law lets people who aren't citizens but have green cards or work permits to vote in city elections. A spokesperson for the council said it would strengthen New York City by increasing civic engagement. A lower court ruled last month that the law violates the state's constitution. It would allow around 800,000 non-citizens to vote in city elections, like for the mayor or city council. A coalition of conservatives challenged the law, saying it would diminish the votes of tax-paying U.S. citizens. New Yorkers are voting in the Empire State's primary elections next week. High school students in Queens, New York, share their thoughts on politics and what they think about the importance of voting. Entity's Arian Pastar has a story. I feel like women and minorities definitely need to be considered more. The Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria in Queens recently hosted the Art of Democracy Forum. Over 100 11th and 12th graders participated in the interactive event. Although they are not allowed to vote yet, many of the students in the heavily democratic city of New York have already formed their political views. Ever since I was younger, you know, as a student and I think as somebody who like, cares about other people, gun control was a huge thing for me. One of the forum's organizers says it's important to teach young people how to vote. Voting helps by us going to the ballots and seeing what it is that we want to see to be changed. And I know it could be like a little challenging not knowing, you know, who we're voting for and stuff like that. But this is why I do something. New York State will hold its primaries next Tuesday. 
Across the United States, voters aged 18 to 34 will make up over 40 million potential voters in 2024. That's nearly one-fifth of all voters. Arian Pastar, NTD News. A winter storm system dumped dense snow, sleet and ice across Minnesota and parts of the upper Midwest yesterday. The eight inches of snow in the Twin Cities were enough to shut down schools and cancel or delay flights at the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. The state patrol reported over 400 crashes, injuring over 20 people and killing two since Sunday. Warnings or advisories for blizzard or winter storm conditions included parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. Coming up, rescue efforts are underway for at least six people after a main bridge in Baltimore collapsed. Our reporter Luis Martinez has the latest. And our legal correspondent updates us on the Supreme Court's review of a controversial abortion pill debate. More in just a moment, here on NTD News Today. Chief Division Counsel and DOJ have approved a no-knock breach. We want the subject to be on display, doing the walk of shame, full visual impact. Any questions? Are we becoming a police state? We don't need to have a crime. What we need is a person to look at. And then we go find out what crime you did. FBI! Our focus is shifting. Our main priority as a bureau is going to be domestic terrorism. It really paints anybody who's right of center. If you're a pro-life, pro-family Catholic, they define you as radical. These are anti-government. We are freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Violent extremists, and they must be dealt with. We can do anything we want. What if you could whiten your teeth by simply brushing your teeth? Now you can with Smile Actives, the teeth whitening breakthrough that safely gets your teeth white and keeps them white every day just by brushing your teeth. I never thought that whitening my teeth could be so easy. I just put the gel on the brush, the toothpaste on it, brush, and I can see my white teeth. Simply add Smile Actives to any toothpaste and our patented PolyClean technology activates into a powerful microfoam that penetrates into the enamel surface to safely lift and remove stains. You need a simple way to whiten your teeth without strips, without trays, without going to the dentist. And it was about time that a product was developed that you would be able to do that with just brushing. And now Smile Actives is even better with new Pro Whitening Gel with 33% greater whitening power, clinically shown to whiten teeth faster, up to eight shades. 100% of users saw whiter teeth on food stains, coffee and wine stains, even on veneers, crowns, and dentures. I eat the blueberries, I drink the coffee, and I know that Smile Actives will keep my teeth white every day. If you could use something so easy like Smile Actives to take yellow teeth to white teeth, why wouldn't you? Why spend hundreds of dollars for whitening treatments at the dentist when now you can whiten your teeth with new Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel every time you brush your teeth? Call or go to smileactives.com and for a limited time, get new Pro Whitening Gel for just $24.95. Order in the next five minutes and buy one, get one absolutely free for just $24.95. That's two for one and save 58%. We'll even include free shipping. Get your teeth whiter guaranteed or return it within 60 days for your money back. I smile every day now. <laughs> The difference is literally night and day. So now I'm always smiling, always cheesing, because now my teeth are much whiter. This offer is not available in stores, so call or click now before the special buy one, get one free offer goes away. Property rights are in the spotlight due to highly publicized clashes between squatters and homeowners. A New York City councilwoman held a conference yesterday on the subject. Entity's Daniel Monahan has the highlights from those in attendance. Councilwoman Vicky Palladino addressed residents in Bayside, Queens, telling them the situation with squatting has gotten out of control. You have every right to defend your property. You will do it 
as you need to do it. Palladino brought up the recent case of a woman who inherited an apartment in Manhattan and returned to it from Spain. To find two illegal immigrants in that apartment who beat her to a pulp where her 19-year-old son found her stuffed in a duffel bag. Palladino says society has reached a point where very serious decisions have to be made. According to the councilwoman, the majority of squatters prey on the weakness of New York laws. That puts the tenants backslash squatters ahead of you, the property owners. Palladino told supporters that property rights are one of the most fundamental rights that Americans have. People were gathered outside the house of a homeowner named Susan, who says her house was taken over by squatters who scammed her mom, who has since passed away. I didn't want to sell my mother's house. I haven't even been able to go through her stuff. It's just not fair that I'm forced to sell the house. But to make matters even worse, I sold the house and they still won't leave. This homeowner says his eviction case took two years and that the tenants only paid one month's rent the whole time. They eventually escaped when warrants for their arrest from another state became known. His lawyer told him not to change the locks, as that would be considered an illegal eviction by the courts. A few days later, a new group of people moved into my property without my permission. This constituent says homeowners are treated like criminals. People buy a property thinking this is the American dream and that this is having the retirement fund. And then something like they go away on vacation, someone takes over their home, and the laws are not protecting us. The concerned citizen is calling out lawmakers. The laws have really done a lot of damage to our society. It makes us really question, like, what are elected officials working for? Some in attendance called on people to contact their governmental representatives and demand action on fair laws for homeowners. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, collapsed overnight. Search and rescue operations are still underway for people who fell into the water. NTD's Luis Martinez joins us live now from the scene. Luis, what can you tell us about the situation at the Baltimore Harbor? Yes, good afternoon. Well, as you just mentioned, around 1.30 in the morning, the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the Baltimore Harbor collapsed. The Singaporean flagged container ship, the Dali, struck one of the support beams of the bridge, causing it to collapse. Preliminary information suggests that uh, the container ship lost propulsion, lost control, right before striking uh, the bridge. Uh, also, reports suggest that um, the container ship, the Lee, was able to issue a distress call, a May Day call, before hitting the bridge and alerting authorities to divert traffic uh, going onto uh, the bridge. Let's listen to what Governor Westmore had to say about this tragic incident. This morning, our state is in shock. And I want to take this moment to speak directly to the people of our state, to the victims of this tragedy and their loved ones. All of our hearts are broken, but Maryland, we will get through this because that is the Maryland spirit and that's what Maryland is made of. We are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. So we just heard uh, words from Governor Wes Moore. Uh, the reports from authorities is that at least eight people fell into the water, six of them uh, belonging to a construction crew that was working on potholes on the bridge. Uh, the other two were rescued by authorities. One remains in critical conditions, critical conditions at the hospital. The other one remains in contact with authorities. Uh, the FBI spoke earlier today and said that they had no evidence suggesting that this was a, a, a terror linked attack. Uh, other informations uh, that, that have uh, come up in the morning were that uh, the ship actually dropped anchors before hitting uh, the bridge in order to reduce speed. It's believed that the uh, almost 300 feet container ship hit the bridge at eight knots per hour. Back to you guys. Yeah, Luis, and yeah, best wishes to those that are rescued. Now, what can you tell us about potential victims? 
Well, as, as I just mentioned, at least eight people are believed to have fallen into the water. Six of them are still unaccounted. They belonged to a construction crew that was working on the bridge. The other two people that uh, initially have been believed to have fallen into the water have been rescued. Uh, search and rescue efforts continue. We can see from right here uh, the police boats patrolling the area. Uh, and the back shot is where the bridge was supposed to be. Uh, this bridge uh, was built in 1977. and <clears throat> Authorities say it was uh, structurally sound. There were no structural problems with the bridge. It had four lanes, two going in each direction. It's a, a very important artery here uh, for uh, locals in Baltimore and Maryland as uh, 695 crosses right through this bridge. Yeah, shocking footage just there, Luis, that you showed us of that bridge collapsing and, of course, the losses that you've enumerated. Thank you so much for your report. Until next Coming up, the U.S., U.K., and Ukraine accused in the Moscow Concert Hall attack by a Russian official, according to Russian media. What Western nations are saying. Julian Assange will not be extradited to the United States, at least for now. The demands a London court is now making to the U.S. We'll have the details soon when we return. I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. Invigorating. It was encouraging. Gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must see. Must see. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford. Genuine.com. Hey everyone, it's me, Sebastian, and it is a beautiful day today. We have so much to be grateful for, so just remember, if you see someone without a smile, give them one of yours. I just love inspiring people to be the best they can be, and the reason I'm able to inspire so many people is because people like you, who inspire me with your support of Shriners Hospitals for Children. Since I was little, I've broken a hundred bones, and I've had 19 surgeries. Shriners Hospitals for Children was with me every step of the way. But more than that, they've given me the confidence to know I can do whatever I set my mind to. Like right now, I've set my mind to sharing my smile with you. Did you get it? Because of people like you, I can play the violin. Yeah. I can play piano. Yeah. I can understand. The help I get is only possible because of caring people like you who pick up the phone and call the number on your screen to make your monthly gift. And when you call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Kids like me. And me. And me. And me. So what are you waiting for? You can inspire kids like me by visiting loveshiners.org. After all, you can't help everyone, but you can help someone. So let's go! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving. Join me and bring a smile to the world with your monthly gift today. Please call now. If operators are busy, please call again or go to loveshiners.org right away. Join me and bring a smile to the world. There's always a searching process for beauty. You know it when you see it. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, appears to be stepping up a sabotage campaign against Shenyun Performing Arts.
The New York-based classical Chinese dance company is a top target of the Chinese regime. Shen Yun shares traditional Chinese culture with audiences worldwide. It also uses artistic expression to expose the persecution taking place in China against people of faith. Since its formation, Shen Yun has encountered various forms of CCP interference, harassment, harassment, vandalism over the years, but the communist regime appears to have added a new tactic to disrupt performances. The Performing Arts Group says it received three bomb threats in just over a week. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on this story. The first bomb threat against Shen Yun Performing Arts this month targeted the company's headquarters in New York. An email account with a Chinese name said they'd placed a remote control bomb and threatened to detonate it. A Shen Yun representative told the Epic Times that the FBI is investigating the incident. Then email sent to two theaters threatened to blow up bombs if the theaters didn't cancel upcoming Shen Yun performances. Last week, an account name with Chinese characters sent an email titled The Theater Has Been Bombed to a California venue where Shen Yun was preparing for weekend shows. The email said we randomly placed a lot of bombs in the theater. Theater staff evacuated and called the police. Bomb technicians with detection canines found nothing in their search. A police spokesperson told the Epic Times precautions were taken on the weekend, with no evidence of any type of explosive device. They stated the case and information was forwarded to the FBI for further investigation. A third bomb threat was sent to a theater in Vancouver, British Columbia over the weekend, but performances weren't interrupted. A Vancouver PD spokesperson confirmed that a theater bomb threat came in Saturday, with an investigation revealing it was false. The bomb threats turned out to be empty, but it's not the only disruptive efforts the performing arts company has faced. Two of Shen Yun's tour buses had tires slashed two weeks ago in Costa Mesa, California, the latest in a recurring series of incidents. The tires were vandalized the same way as previous times, halfway through the rubber to burst when driven on the freeway. Many of Shen Yun's artists experienced CCP persecution firsthand in China for practicing Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. It's a meditation practice based on truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. The spiritual practice has been banned and persecuted in China since 1999. A Shen Yun vice president said the threats are the Chinese regime's last-ditch effort to hide the truth, and that the threats are taken seriously with law enforcement authorities involved. Shen Yun performs in around 200 cities worldwide for over 1 million people each year. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Also recently, members of one of the troops were harassed at O'Hare International Airport in Chicago by a customs official speaking Mandarin with a mainland accent. The incident has spurred several Congress members to call for an investigation. Separate from these incidents, the Epic Times recently reported that the New York Times has been working on a hit piece on the company. It comes after years of the outlets downplaying or ignoring human rights abuses happening in China. Communications obtained by the Epoch Times suggest the hit piece has been in the works for about six months. The Epoch Times says the article, which is not published yet, will play into the CCP's transnational repression campaign against Shen Yun. This is significant because Shen Yun exposes, through its expressive dance, the CCP's persecution of the peaceful spiritual movement Falun Gong, many of whom are killed by the Chinese regime for their organs to turn a profit. That information is not what the CCP wants people to know, as evidenced by pressuring theaters to drop performances and persecuting the family members who are in China of Shen Yun performers. And over to New Zealand, the country raised concerns with Beijing about a Chinese cyber attack on Tuesday. This comes after its intelligence services found state-sponsored Chinese hackers breached New Zealand's parliament in 2021. I'm not going to go into the details of uh, the data uh, specifically, but I will say that uh, from uh, the analysis that's been conducted, uh, that uh, sensitive uh, or information of a sensitive or strategic nature uh, was not removed from uh, the system. Some information was removed uh, from the networks, uh, and we believe that that was of a more technical nature, uh, the sort of uh, data that would have facilitated uh, more intrusive work. The move comes a day after U.S. and British officials announced sweeping charges against seven hackers, all believed to be living in China. Their targets are high profile. White House staffers, U.S. senators, British lawmakers and government officials from across the world who have criticized Beijing. Another trade dispute. China filed a complaint against the U.S. at the World Trade Organization today. 
That's because starting this year, U.S. electric vehicle buyers can't get the up to $7,500 credit if the cars have components or minerals sourced from China. The regulation aims to reduce reliance on China. Beijing argues the rule is discriminatory. China dominates the EV supply chain, one example being lithium, a type of metal used to make EV batteries. China refines over 60 percent of the metal globally. The rule took effect in January. Under it, only 13 out of more than 50 EVs on sale in the U.S. are eligible for tax credits, a dramatic plunge compared to 2023. The tax credits are part of the Biden administration's push to, into America's green energy transition. Biden has pledged to cut carbon emissions in half by 2030 and hit zero emissions by 2050. But with China dominating green energy industries, some are wondering, would America's green energy future depend on Beijing? China holds a near monopoly on clean energy supply chains. On top of lithium, it also has a commanding hold on nickel and cobalt, minerals essential for EV battery components. It's the world's largest refiner of these minerals and supplies up to 70 percent of them. House Speaker Mike Johnson has named Congressman John Mulinar as the next chairman of the House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party. Yesterday's announcement comes ahead of Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher's early retirement next month. Johnson said yesterday that Molinar will be exceptional in the role. He attributed that to his leadership experience and academic background, along with respect from colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Molinar says he looks forward to working with the Democratic ranking member to help the U.S., quote, win the competition against the CCP. The select committee is a way for lawmakers to highlight economic and national security challenges posed by the CCP and recommend policies to respond. The panel had considerable influence over the House TikTok bill, which would force the Chinese-owned company to divest or face a U.S. app store ban. Next, illegal Chinese imports causing trouble for U.S. food safety again. The Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS, has sent out a warning last week about a Chinese fish product. The smuggled goods have been found in three U.S. states. Next, illegal Chinese imports causing trouble for U.S. food safety again. The Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS, has sent out a warning last week about a Chinese fish product. The smuggled goods have been found in three U.S. states. The announcement says 12-ounce packs of frozen fish parts called Pangasius Malls were found in retail stores in New York, Pennsylvania, and Oklahoma. Pangasius are a kind of freshwater catfish native to Southeast Asia. Maws are swim bladders the fish use to control their buoyancy in the water. They're a popular food in southern China, especially in Cantonese cuisine. But without import permission, the federal agency warned the smuggled fish products from China are, quote, unfit for human consumption, adding people who had purchased the product should dispose of them mindfully. Retailers are also banned from selling the unapproved products. Now, the agency is still investigating how the fish products made their way to the U.S. Russian state news reports that an official is accusing the United States, the U.K. and Ukraine of being behind the Moscow concert hall attack. Russian President Vladimir Putin also suggested Ukraine may have played a role in the attack. Friday's shooting killed at least 139 people and left 182 wounded. The U.S. State Department has said Ukraine was not involved. The Islamic State terror group claimed responsibility and released footage of the attack. Western countries, including the U.S. and France, have said their intelligence indicates that ISIS-K, Islamic State's Afghan offshoot, was responsible. Eight suspects are in pretrial detention after gunmen shot concert goers in Russia's deadliest terror attack in two decades. Russia said the four suspected gunmen confessed. They showed signs of injuries when they appeared in court. And staying in Europe, we have some short headlines from Belgium, Germany and other European countries. Julian Assange will not be extradited to the United States, at least for now. The WikiLeaks founder secured a temporary win today. London's high court says the U.S. must guarantee Assange would not face the death penalty. 
If they don't do so by April 16th, he'll be eligible to appeal his extradition. American prosecutors are seeking to put Assange on trial on 18 counts. That's over his high-profile release of confidential U.S. military records and diplomatic information. A further hearing has been scheduled for May 20th, meaning his extradition has been put on hold. Russia is extending pretrial detention of an American Wall Street Journal reporter. A Moscow court today ordered Evan Gershkovich to remain in jail on espionage charges until at least late June. He's currently being held at Moscow's Lefortovo prison, which is notorious for its harsh conditions. The American was arrested almost exactly one year ago while on a reporting trip in central Russia. Gershkovich and his employer have denied the espionage allegations. The U.S. government has declared him to be wrongfully detained. Belgian farmers sprayed manure towards police in the nation's capital today. The police responded by using water cannons and tear gas. Dozens of tractors sealed off streets close to European Union headquarters. They're protesting ahead of a meeting of EU agriculture ministers. The farmers are against increased environmental measures, cheap imports, and unbalanced trading practices. Due to the protests, authorities asked commuters to stay out of Brussels and work from home today. And farmers in the UK are also protesting. They drove dozens of tractors towards Britain's parliament on Monday to protest rules that they say are endangering livelihoods and food security. Similar to farmers in the EU, the ones in the UK are also protesting cheap imports that undercut prices. Some tractors had signs reading, Stop Substandard Imports. Britain has so far not seen large-scale farmers' protests like those in France and other European countries. Lastly, Germans won't have to deal with yet another strike at the nation's rail operator over the Easter holidays. Deutsche Bahn today said it agreed to a deal with the workers' union. They'll now gradually reduce train drivers' working hours and increase their wages. Th this ends months of dispute and nationwide strikes. As part of the deal, both sides agreed that there won't be any more strikes for nearly two years. Up ahead, an Italian orchestra plays a symphony inspired by a World War II massacre. The concert marks 80 years since the horrific atrocity. More shortly here on NTD News Today. If you're living with diabetes, this is the sound that could change your life. Great news for people living with diabetes. Now you can wear a continuous glucose monitor and eliminate routine finger sticks. The days of repeated painful finger sticks are over. Just call 800-215-1658. If you use insulin daily to manage your condition, a continuous glucose monitor could help you control your diabetes and reduce or eliminate those painful finger sticks. If you have Medicare or private insurance, US Med can deliver a CGM system right to your door. And if you qualify, there may be little or no cost to you. Shipping is free and we'll even bill your insurer directly. Call now to get your continuous glucose monitoring system so you can take control of your diabetes and get back to enjoying life. Just call 800-215-1658. That's 800-215-1658. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Just kids, hungry, homeless, and vulnerable. Abused kids often feel safer on the street. Now, more than ever, that's the most dangerous place of all. Covenant House is rescuing and protecting kids during this COVID-19 crisis. We're providing safe shelter to thousands, but the need is overwhelming, and no child is ever turned away. 
please call or go online now with your gift of $19 a month to help a homeless child. You will provide safe shelter, hot meals, and medical care. Your gift will show our kids they're loved. Homeless kids are afraid and alone with nowhere else to turn. You want to know that there's somewhere you can go that's safe. So the Covenant House did that for us. Please call now. With your gift of $19 a month, we'll send you this soft, comforting blanket to show you're helping our kids. Please don't wait. In our national crisis, your gift is the lifeline a child needs. Please call or go online to safeplacetosleep.org now. Thank you for saving precious lives. For the day's top headlines and the news you need to know, tune in right here to NTD Evening News. Baseball star Shohei Otani says he's the victim of theft by his former interpreter. At a Monday news conference, he said he has never bet on baseball or knowingly paid a bookmaker. Uh, just on a personal note, uh, I'm very saddened and shocked that someone who I'm trusted has done this. They were Otani's first public remarks after a gambling scandal broke last week that led to the firing of his interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara, by his team, the Los Angeles Dodgers. ESPN reported last Wednesday that at least $4.5 million had been transferred from Otani's account to a Southern California gambling operation. And his attorneys told the LA Times last week that Mizuhara had used the ballplayer's funds to pay off an alleged illegal bookmaker who is reportedly under federal investigation. Questions surrounding Otani's involvement swirled after the media reports emerged during the MLB's opening two-game series in Seoul where the Dodgers were playing. That appeared to have prompted him to address reporters days later, where he left without taking questions. Up until a couple of days ago, I didn't know that this was happening. Um, just to kind of just go over the result, uh, in conclusion, uh, Ipe has been stealing money from my account and has told lies. Otani also said he was unaware Mizuhara had gambling debts. He has been by Otani's side since he joined Major League Baseball in 2018. Otani said Mizuhara admitted to him last week that he had been using the star player's account to make the payments, at which point he had contacted his lawyers. Otani added that he was assisting in all investigations into the matter. And next we'll tune into a speech by President Biden, which he's giving right now in regards to the Baltimore Bridge collapse in which at least six people are still missing. Let's tune in. Issues that are open that we've got to determine what's going to happen in terms of the rescue mission and the like, but I'll... Do you, do you plan to go to Baltimore, sir, and if so, how quickly? I do, and as quickly as I can. You said the federal government's also going to pay for the repairs. I'm just curious, this was a ship that appears to be at fault. Is there any reason to believe that the company behind the ship should be held responsible? And then also, you that mentioned... That could be, but we're not going to wait for that happen. We're going to pay for it to get the bridge rebuilt and open. What did you make Mr. of President. Israel's decision not to attend this meeting this week? Oh, I don't want to get into that. We've got plenty Rafa. of time to talk about Rafa. You mentioned the port. Uh, the port. Can I ask about cars? About the port. Thank you, Rafa. 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 For round-the-clock original news coverage, please visit us at ntd.com or you can download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world.